Well, hello, brothers and sisters. I'm so glad you're here with me once again as we're going to get in the Word of God. And I know His voice will be loud and clear. He will speak to your minds and speak to your hearts as you tune into His sweet, loving voice. So why don't we go ahead? Let's start off with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this time as we truly know our lives belong to you. You are so pleased. And so, Lord, as we come here today, we're ready to receive from you. I pray that your words will speak life to us as we truly desire you in everything that we say, everything that we do. We give this time all unto you now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. We are in part five of a sermon series called What the World Needs Now. And yes, as a song with the same title indicates, what the world needs now is love, sweet love, not only just for some, but for everyone. And yes, as I have previously stated, we definitely need more of God's love in the world, which is actually one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But the truth of the matter is, is that we actually desperately need them all. And they are all found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Let me read it to you once again. This is what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, so far, we covered the fruits of patience, peace, gentleness, and kindness. Well, this week, we will discuss the fruit of goodness. And with this fruit of goodness, we must first understand that this goodness is from the Lord. So what we may see as goodness from God, the world may not see as being good. And also vice versa. What the world may see as good, we simply may not, especially if your life is filled with the Spirit and the Word of God. You know, as Christians, we may often ask God to bless us abundantly with His goodness. Hey, nothing wrong with that. But we have to make sure that this goodness lines up with His standards, not of this world. Take, for example, just the other day, you know, someone offered me a bottle of soda. And if you know me, I love to drink soda, especially Pepsi. And when I was younger, I was drinking up to like two, three, sometimes four cans a day, if you can believe that. And I can almost picture, you know, ice cold Pepsi being served in heaven. Like the commercial, you know, they open the can, pop, and what do you do? You chug it down, and right after that, you go, ah. You know, in the past, I would usually never turn down a Pepsi, especially if someone offered me one. But several years ago, my, my doctor, he told me that my blood test revealed that I was borderline diabetic and that I needed to cut down in sugar. And we know for a fact, right, that soda has a lot of sugar in it. And to top that off, my dentist told me, you know, excessive drinking of soda can cause Tooth, tooth decay and cavities. So, you know, in most cases now, I would say, uh, thank you, but I better not. But, you know, in the past, if you gave me two, a two liter bottle of Pepsi and bags of mochi crunch and potato chips, hey, I would think that you are my best friend and I would probably consume everything in no time. And I would think that all this junk food is so good. And that what? That you are so good to me. You know, I thought about this. You know, this is a good example of when what we think is a good thing isn't really that good at all. And yes, God's goodness can abound in our lives, but we must be careful of what kind of goodness we are actually desiring in our lives. You know, in today's sermon, we will be discussing when goodness is from God and is really good for us, and when goodness may not be so good for us and may come from our own fleshly desires or of the world. 
You know, God's goodness can come in many forms. But to simplify things here, we will define God's goodness as His desire to bless His children abundantly. And this is how the prophet uh, Nehemiah saw it. This is what it says in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 25. It says here, They captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took possession of houses filled with all kinds of good things, wells already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate to the full and were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness. You know, when it has to do with God's goodness, oh, there is great joy and there is contentedness in all that God gives and provides. You know, anything else that may be defined as good, i got to tell you, it may be questionable. If it's not from God, it's questionable. And so with today's sermon, we will discuss how we will know whether or not what we perceive as goodness is actually from God or not. So here's the question. So how can we know when the goodness is from God? Look at point number one. It says here, when this goodness makes you look less into self and the things of the world. Let's look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. It says here, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us. But Jesus said to him, Who said I should judge or decide between you? Then Jesus said to them, Be careful and guard against all kinds of greed. Life is not measured by how much one owns. Then Jesus told this story. There was a rich man who had some land who grew a good crop. He thought to himself, what will I do? I have no place to keep all my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all other goods. Then I can say to myself, I have enough good things stored to last for many years. Rest, eat, drink, and enjoy life. But God said to him, Foolish man, tonight your life will be taken from you. So who will get those things you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for those who store up things for themselves and not and are not rich toward God. So what does it mean to be rich towards God? You know, it really means taking the focus off of yourself and being rich towards others, being selfless with a willingness to put others first. And you know, when you're so focused on yourself, you can't really do anything productive for God. Why? Because God wants you to serve others and love them, yes, even more than you love yourself. And if you were the farmer, you know, automatically you should say that, you know, God provided and blessed me with so much. You know what? I want to bless others now. And that's my desire. I just want to bless as many people as I can. And, you know, the same goes for being too focused on the things of the world. Let, let's look at what Jesus says about this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. It says there, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. You know, I want to tell you a story written by a well-known author named Leo Tolstoy. You know, he tells about a successful peasant farmer who just was not satisfied with what he owned. You know, one day he received an offer he simply could not refuse. He was told that for $1,000, he could take claim and ownership of all the land that he could walk around on for one whole day. So if he walked on the land, it was his, right? So the only catch in the deal was that he had to be back 
at his starting point by sundown. So early the next morning, he started out walking at a very fast pace. And by midday, he was very tired. But he just kept on going, you know, covering more and more ground. You know, well into the afternoon, he realized that his greed had taken him far from the starting point. And he started to move a lot faster and started to run as the sun started to sink low in the sky. And he knew if he didn't make it back by sundown, he would lose his chance to be a bigger landowner. So when the sun started to sink below the horizon, he came within sight of the finish line. You know, he started to sprint as fast as he could, his heart pounding like crazy, and he's gasping for breath. You know, he staggered over the finish line just as the sun disappeared. And he immediately collapsed, blood streaming from his mouth. And in a few minutes, he was dead. And afterwards, his servants dug a grave. It was not much over six feet long and three feet wide. And actually, that's how much land was needed for his burial. Oh, you know, the title of Tolstoy's story was how much land does a man really need? <laughs> you know, so we must ask ourselves, is our mind, is our heart focused on what God wants to put our focus on? You know, if we're focusing everything upon ourselves, you know, we're in trouble, you know, and we got to realize God, he wants us to put our hearts, our minds on others. So once again, the question is, when can we know when the goodness is from God? Well, look at point number two. It says here, when this goodness in your life creates in you a more giving heart. You know, this was the case, you know, when Moses called upon the Israelites to contribute their resources and belongings to the building of the temple. And this is what it this is what happened in Exodus chapter 36, verses 3 to 7. Let me read it to you. It says here, They, meaning the skilled workers, right? They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people, look what it says there. They were restrained, restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Wow. You know, can you imagine that all the Israelites, you know, they were so pleased. They were so happy with, you know, what God had provided to them time and time again, you know. And they knew that God constantly provided for them so that they were so generous because they just wanted to contribute all that they had. They were giving their very best to build God's temple. And, you know, this is the kind of heart, you know, a person has when they truly realize, you know, God's goodness is from Him. And that He will continually bless as we choose to have a generous heart a heart that's willing to share, a, a heart that's willing to give of our very best to Him and to others. And truly, this person's level of generosity will definitely be increased. You know, there's a story uh, that is told that one day a beggar by the roadside asked for money from Alexander the Great as he passed along uh, with his officials on, on, a, on a dirt road. And the man was poor and wretched and, and was pretty bold to have the nerve to even speak to the emperor. Yet the emperor threw him several gold coins. You know, a, a, an official was astonished at his generosity and he commented, Sir, copper coins would adequately meet a beggar's need. 
Why give him gold? And you know what? Alexander the Great, the emperor, he responded in royal fashion. And this is what he said. He says, copper coins would suit the beggar's need, but gold coins would suit Alexander's giving. Oh, you know, when a believer realizes that there is so much of God's goodness in his life, and he knows this from the Lord, right? He will only give as a child of God would give with great heart and great abundance. So how else can we know when the goodness is from God? Well, look at this last point in point number three. It says here, when this goodness had come forth in your life, when you had made things right with God. You know, in the book of Jeremiah, we, we find that God's people had strayed far away from Him, far away from His presence, and with the worship of idols and the desires of wild living, yeah, they were far, far from the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah had clearly indicated to them that when they had made the decision to make things right with God, His goodness would surely follow. And this is what Jeremiah constantly was telling them. You make things right with Him, you know, things will get so much better for you. Look what it says here in Jeremiah 31 verses 10 through 12. It says here, Listen to this message from the Lord, you nations of the world. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. The Lord who scattered his people will gather them and watch over them as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Israel from those too strong for them. They will come home and sing songs of joy on the heights of Jerusalem. They will be radiant because of the Lord's good gifts. The abundant crops of grain, new wine and olive oil, and the healthy flocks and herds. Their life will be like a watered garden, and all their sorrows will be gone. You know, not only would God give a great abundance of His goodness in material things, but also in wisdom and knowledge, so that we will not be making the same mistakes over and over. And, and, you know, Jesus, he made this very clear uh, when his disciples asked him why he had to speak in parables to the unbelievers. Look what it says here in Matthew 13, verses 10 through 13. It says here, his disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? And he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others, like the unbelievers, are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. The thing is, right, when we listen to what God is telling us to, to do, hey, we got to do it. We got to realize this is wisdom from the Lord, and if we choose to do it, we will be blessed. You know, there's a journal journalist. His name is uh, Eunice Pike, and he lived with the Mazatec Indians for over 40 years, and she discovered many interesting cultures and customs of this tribe. You know, with this tribe, they do not like to wish someone well. They don't like to teach one another new things or even share the gospel. You know, if the village baker was asked who taught him how to bake bread, he would simply say, I just know, I taught myself with no one's help. And Eunice says that this odd behavior stems from the Indians' concept of limited good. They believe that there is only so much good, so much knowledge, so much love to go around. To teach another means you might drain yourself of knowledge. And to love a second child means you have to love the first child less. <laughs> wow. And... No, to wish someone well, saying have a good day, means you have just given away some of your own happiness, which cannot be reacquired. Wow, can you imagine that? <laughs> That's what they believe. But here's the thing we got to understand. Not so with God. When your life is made right with Him, He gives His goodness above and beyond 
whatever you could imagine. And when you had made things right with God, His goodness had come forth in your, in your life. And you suddenly realize that your everyday desires had also changed. Because now you're set upon Him. You're set upon what His Word instructs you to do in your everyday lives. You know, look at what the Apostle Paul had to say in Romans chapter 13, verses 12 to 14. It says here, The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the, to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral, immoral living or in the quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in your evil desires. You know, for some Christians, if they do have a lot of good things in their lives, they, they cannot, you know, they simply cannot resist, you know, slipping back into their former worldly and evil desires. And what if you were asked the question, what would you do for, a, for $10 million? You know, of the hundreds of thousands Americans polled, you know, some would agree to at least one or several of the following. Here, here's what they found. 20% now, if they were to be given $10 million, 25% would abandon their families. Wow. And 25% would abandon their church. 23% would become prostitutes for a week or more. 16% would give up their American citizenships. 16% would leave their spouses. 10% would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% would kill a stranger. And 3% would put their children up for adoption. Oh, can you imagine that? And this is what the Apostle Paul had said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. It says here, For the love of money, not just money, for the love of money is what? The root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Wow. You know, when a person thinks that God's goodness is only about material possessions and and you know, further gain in wealth, they will eventually wander away from their faith in God. Because eventually, what's really going to happen is they're going to start to worship their new God, which is money. All right, well, let's take a look at the bottom line verses now. Let's look what it says here in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. Jesus says, Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? You know, brothers and sisters, we all must come to a point in our lives in which God is always given first priority in our lives. You know, no matter how little or how much we have, it should never affect our relationship with God. We must realize that His goodness just doesn't come in the form of the physical things and provisions that we can receive from Him in this life we have on this planet Earth. You know, several years ago, one of uh, Southern California's infamous wildfires destroyed the home of this best-selling writer named Aldous Huxley. You know, he and his wife barely escaped with their lives. But Huxley's manuscripts, along with his collection of letters from great people of his day and his expansive library of valuable books, which had taken years to accumulate, you know, they were all destroyed. 
and all his earthly possessions lay in ashes now on the ground. It was a hideous experience, he later told his good friend. But this is what he says, it did make me feel extraordinarily clean. You know, it really shouldn't take a wildfire driven by the Santa Ana winds to release us from our bondage to our stuff. You know, simply choose, as the Apostle Paul did, to count everything you have as loss. Look what it says here. Look what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. He says here, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, he says, that I may gain Christ. You know, doesn't it remind you of someone a couple thousand years ago who, despite his selflessness, also, he, he wasn't popular in the public opinion polls, but he spoke the truth. And he knew that his life wasn't about himself. It truly was about others. And look what it says here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It says here, Though he was God, meaning Jesus, it says here, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. What was Jesus' divine privileges, you may ask? Well, yes, he is Father God's son, but remember, he is also God. He is God, the son. You know, the Bible says he created everything and he actually owns everything, but yet he humbled himself and he gave up everything he had. Why? Because of his deep, deep love for us. He was willing to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. When was the last time you gave up anything for God? When was the last time you were willing to make a sacrifice for Him? Yes, it is fine to desire from God the good things that this world has to offer. You know, a nice house, a nice car, a secure job, a good family, etc., etc. But what is of the greatest goodness we must realize is His Son, Jesus Christ Himself. And when we truly have Him, I mean really have Him in our lives, we will have all that we would ever need in our lives. And we will never be lacking of His goodness ever again in our lives. Look what it says here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. It says here, So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and He will give you everything that you need. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when we follow what Jesus tells us here, then and only then will you be able to say what the psalmist said in Psalm 34, verse 8. Look what he says. He says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. And when we daily experience God's goodness through His Son, Jesus, I'm telling you, everything in our lives is bound to be good. You're going to taste and see. And with all your other exper experiences that you will have in your life, you're going to know it's all good. Because you know what? God, He's in it. And He's going to continually do it as you trust in Him and believe in Him. Amen? Well, praise God. Let's go ahead and let's bow our heads. Let's bow our hearts. Let's come before our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this message that was spoken today. And Father, as we truly desire your goodness, I know, Father, you're going to shower our lives with more 
and more of all the good things that you desire for us. And Father, as we live our lives fully devoted to you, I pray, Lord, that, that we're going to know. We don't have to worry about, about the things that, that the world may say, oh, I need this, I need that. No, Father, we know you're always going to provide your goodness upon our lives as we look to you in all things, as we trust in you, as we believe in you, as we come with our hearts fully surrendered to you. Father, we love you so much, and we continually give you glory, honor, and praise in all we say and all we do. We all pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we say together, Amen. Well, praise God and praise God. I'm so glad you have joined me today. And next week, we'll continue the sermon series called What the World Needs Now. And we're going to be covering part six. All right. So hope to see you next week. And don't forget, give God all the glory. Amen. <laughs>